Welcome to the Electricity of Life, brought to you by the Thunderbolts Project at thunderbolts.info. In the 21st century, scientific discovery routinely forces a new perspective on the nature of reality, including physical phenomena at every scale in the cosmos. One of the strangest beliefs in cosmology was that celestial bodies exist in isolation, with no connection or influence on one another. However, today our most powerful telescopes reveal astonishing networks of plasma filaments, which connect stars and galaxies across unfathomable distances. It's been said that no man is an island, and likewise, in our electric universe, no islands exist in space. For generations, a similar strange belief about the human body has prevailed in the world of Western medicine. Specialization means treating each organ and part of the body as a separate, isolated instrument. And just as finer technological data reveals the connectedness of the most distant celestial objects, today mainstream medicine increasingly recognizes the basis for a more integrative approach to human health. Just as an electrical circuitry connects distant celestial objects, the electrical circuitry of the body is a stupendous, complex network central to life. One of the leading pioneers in integrative health is Dr. Jerry Tennant, a world-renowned ophthalmologist whose book series Healing is Voltage describes his groundbreaking research into the body's circuitry. Recently, Dr. Tennant offered a series of presentations as part of a continuing medical education class for naturopathic doctors in Arizona. Dr. Tennant and his group have kindly granted us permission to share these presentations in a series of videos. In this introductory episode, Dr. Tennant begins with a remarkable summary of his personal and professional journey. To further explore Dr. Tennant's resources and materials, you may visit the links in the description box of this video. This is Dr. Jerry Tennant. I'd like to discuss with you some concepts about healing is voltage. First of all, a notice Tennant Institute is a private expressive association as defined by law and is under the direction of Jerry Tennant, MD, MDH, PSCD. This lecture is given under the auspices of my Arizona MDH license and not my Texas MD license, partially with the support of a contribution by Synergy Medical Group. Participation in the seminar uh, implies that the participant is given an acknowledgement of the rights noted above and others recognized by law and asserts 1st, 9th, 14th Amendment rights. Participation means I voluntarily license Jerry Tennant, MD, MDH, PSCD to counsel me with his Arizona MDH license. Disclosure of interests. I likely have a financial interest in patented and or trademark devices and books that carry my name. The concepts presented here were contributed to by many people, including the staff of the Tenet Institute, Dr. Stephen Evans, Dr. Max Collins, Dr. Nathan Bryan, Carrie Lynn Carter, Leo Simborski, Dr. Robert Gilbert, Dr. Richard Hull, Eileen McCusick, Dr. Dan Winter, and Dr. Kareem from Cairo, Egypt in biogeometry. So I was trained as an ophthalmologist and had a great deal of uh, enjoyment and fun in, in doing so. I was able to do a lot of different things in ophthalmology, but one of the things that I did was to do the majority of the research for uh, the laser from the company called Visex used in LASIK surgery. So as an ophthalmologist, I was able to accomplish many of the things that people strive to do. I was successful in uh, my efforts as an ophthalmology. I helped change the way ophthalmology is practiced by introducing and helping to develop the techniques for outpatient eye surgery. I developed uh, intraocular lenses that were widely used uh, in eyes after cataract surgery. And one of the things that I was able to do was the majority, as I mentioned, of research for the laser used in LASIK surgery. So one of the problems was that we didn't recognize that the laser wouldn't kill viruses. 
And so I treated a gentleman from Europe who had leukemia and also had scarring in his cornea. And I used the laser to carve this, the scar off his cornea. What we didn't understand at the time was that the laser would not kill viruses. And as the viruses escaped his cornea, they went up through my mask, through my nose and into my brain. And I developed encephalitis. That resulted in me uh, having overwhelming fatigue. I got to the place where I could see a patient and know what was wrong with them, but I couldn't remember how to write a prescription. Also, I developed spastic movements, which doesn't work really well if you're operating inside somebody's eyeball. And I came to the place that, that I could only have two or three hours a day in which I could think clearly enough to understand a newspaper. Otherwise, I spent about 16 hours a day sleeping. I also had a bleeding disorder uh, and um, had some bleeding under my skin. If you'll notice the picture with the dogs, you'll see that I had viruses in my uh, brain and viruses in my spleen. And these two dogs seemed to understand where my problems were. So the brown dog Tiger would always come and lay on my head. And the white dog Pooh would come and curl up next to my spleen. So I always considered these two dogs the original biomodulators. So as you can see in the image of me, I was robust and uh, had a great life. But then slowly over time, as you can see, I began to fade away and to where I was uh, basically totally dysfunctional. I eventually figured out that the difference between peak performance and death was voltage. So I began to, uh, in the two or three hours a day I could think, I began to read cellular biology books with the concept that if I could figure out how to one, make one cell work, I could figure out how to make them all work. Because after all, cells look different, but they really have the same hardware, just different software. And in all of the cellular biology books, I began to realize that uh, cells had to have voltage to work. <coughs> so for a moment, let's look at the concept of regeneration versus healing. If I cut myself with a knife, then this skin will heal, uh, leaving behind perhaps a small scar. On the other hand, if I cut off a finger, but that finger actually regrows, then that's called a regeneration. And regeneration is controlled by voltage. So the purpose of this lecture, among others, is to focus on the role of voltage in stem cell function, along with exosomes and recovery from chronic disease. This subject cannot be adequately covered in the few minutes we have allotted, but it's hoped that this lecture will focus your attention on its role so you will want to learn more. Now, the foundation work of this subject was done by Robert Becker and by Dr. Jorn Nordenstrom. Becker wrote the book, The Body Electric. Nordenstrom wrote the book, Biologically Closed Electric Circuits. So each of us working in this field are standing on the shoulders of these pioneers. So in Becker's work, he was interested in the subject of if a human loses a piece of bone, they grow more bone. But if they lose another body part, it's replaced with scar. And he wondered why that was. Why is it that the human can make bone but has difficulty replacing other organs? So to study this, he used the salamander. The salamander has essentially the same anatomy as the human. That is the same number of bones, muscles, and nerves, and in the same arrangement. But unlike the human, the salamander is capable of growing an exact replacement of an arm, leg, eye, ear, up to a third of its brain, almost all of its digestive tract, and up to a half of its heart. The salamander is so efficient at regeneration that it does not get cancer. The regeneration of the salamander cannot be explained by chemical mechanistic views of traditional medicine. So. Becker uh, studied the salamander by studying its voltage patterns. So he found that if you cut off the salamander's arm, 
uh, then over the next uh, days uh, it would actually grow a new arm. So a salamander's base voltage is minus 10 millivolts compared to a human which is minus 25 millivolts as we'll discuss later. As the arm is amputated the voltage drops to approximately uh, plus 25 millivolts of electron stealer. So again, it goes from minus 10 millivolts of electron donor to plus 25 millivolts of electron stealer. Then the voltage begins to recover, and as it does so, it eventually gets up to minus 30 millivolts of electron donor. And as this occurs, then stem cells are formed and the, uh, the salamander grows a new arm in somewhere around 25 to 30 days. Now, Becker found that after you amputate the arm, the skin grows over the stump and then at somewhere around a week or so, a stem cells uh, began to accumulate uh, in the stump and by two weeks or so there are, is a large number of um, stem cells and then by three weeks the arm is beginning to regrow and uh, somewhere uh, in the neighborhood of uh, day, day 25 or so uh, the hand begins to form. Now, he found some other very interesting things. So if he amputated the arm and waited until the uh, stem cells formed and he extracted those uh, and made an incision somewhere else in the body, uh, the uh, salamander would grow uh, whatever the local area was. So for example, if he amputated an arm early on uh, extracted the stem cells, made a slit by the salamander's hind leg and put the stem cells in there, it would grow another hind leg uh, from those stem cells. On the other hand, if he waited until the stem cells were more mature uh, before he extracted them, it was totally different. So he amputated the arm, he waits till the stem cells are somewhat matured, extracts them, makes an incision um, on the top of the salamander's head and puts them in there, the salamander will grow an arm out the top of his head. So what became obvious is that early on the stem cells had not been programmed into what they were to become and if le wherever you put them they would become uh, or regenerate one of those body parts. On the other hand, if you left them a bit longer, they would be programmed to become what they uh, were locally. And then when you extracted them and put them elsewhere, they would continue to grow that organ. Now in the lower right uh, picture, you see uh, uh, an image of a dog that was on the news recently who had a tail growing out from between his eyebrows. And of course, uh, they didn't seem to understand how this could happen, but looking at Becker's work, it's quite obvious. The stem cells from this dog's tail had been programmed to grow another tail, but somehow got moved and inserted between his eyes uh, and thus grew a tail there. In this uh, image, we see uh, an amputation uh, of a salamander's arm at 48 hours, and you can see the bone sticking out the end. You can see the skin is, and the muscles have retracted somewhat. Here at 18 days, you can see the stem cells uh, that are quite prominent. This is the collection of stem cells are called a blastema. And you can see, begin to see the dedifferentiation of the muscle cells. Here at 42 days, the limb pattern is completely restored and as the salamander continues to grow the new arm. Now this is an image of a, a young boy who was a passenger on a four-wheeler. The driver of the four-wheeler uh, turned it too sharply and actually caused the four-wheeler to roll, uh, resulting in this injury. 
this boy was taken to the hospital the, and taken to surgery and the wound was cleaned up. The surgeons felt that this was going to require uh, attention by the plastic surgeons and that perhaps uh, that uh, recovery would be difficult. I received a call from his father and uh, he sent me a picture uh, that you saw. So I quickly sent him a biotransducer and a biomodulator, which um, of course the biotransducer puts out scalar energy and the biomodulator puts out electromagnetic energy. The boy had been crying uh, constantly since his injury in spite of the narcotics that they were giving him. Within minutes after they placed the d devices in this position, as you can see, the boy quit crying. The following day, they, he was taken back to surgery and the plastic surgeon showed up, but uh, the, uh, sur the general surgeons were able to uh, close this primarily without a, a skin graft and the plastic surgeons were saying, so why are we here as they uh, left the operating room? Well, the picture on the right is a recent photograph of this boy's uh, uh, foot. You can see that uh, it healed quite well. And this boy now can play soccer and football and uh, has no apparent symptoms that he ever had this injury. So to some degree, you'll have to acknowledge that this uh, was uh, in some regards uh, regeneration as well as uh, uh, improved healing with uh, by restoring the voltage to the area. So you must realize that the human body is an electronic device. Now, any cellular biology book will tell you that cells are designed to run at a pH of 7.35 to 7.45. pH is actually the measurement of voltage in a solution. So if you have a copper wire, if the switch is on, their electrons flow through it. And if you turn the switch off, they do not. And that's called conductive electricity. But a liquid is completely different. And that is a liquid has the ability to be either an electron donor or an electron stealer. And so if you take a, a pH meter, which is a, a type of sophisticated voltmeter, it has a switch in which you can measure in millivolts or you can measure in pH. So by convention, if the liquid is an electron stealer, you put a plus sign in front of the voltage. And if it's an electron donor, you put a minus sign in front of it. And then you convert it to a logarithmic scale that goes from zero to 14. So plus 400 millivolts of electron stealer is the same as a pH of zero and minus 400 millivolts of electron donor is the same as a pH of 14. If it's neither a electron donor nor an electron stealer, it's a pH of seven. Now, um, I mentioned that all cellular biology books will tell you that cells are designed to run at a pH of 7.35 to 7.45. So 7.35 is an, a synonym of minus 20 millivolts of electron donor, and 7.45 is a synonym of minus 25 millivolts of electron donor. So what you see is that cells are designed to run between minus 20 and minus 25 millivolts. Now, some people get confused because if you take a cell and put it into a Petri dish and put an electrode inside the cell and another outside the cell and measure the voltage across the cell membrane, you'll get about minus 90 millivolts. However, the environment in which cells are designed to run is between minus 20 and minus 25 millivolts. So cells may need minus 25 millivolts to run correctly and minus 50 millivolts to make new cells. So this leads us to understand that all chronic disease is characterized by having inadequate voltage. Let me say that one more time. All chronic disease is characterized by having inadequate voltage. Now, the other thing that's important to realize in understanding chronic disease is that we're constantly wearing ourselves out and having to make new cells. So 
different sources have slightly different times uh, because studies are based on tissue turnover time from natural stable isotope labeling, which varies according to bomb testing and other environmental factors. However, in general, you will find that you get new cells in the macula of your eye every 48, 48 hours. The lining of your guts replaced every three days. Your skin is six weeks old. Your liver is eight weeks old. Your nervous system is between eight and 12 months old, etc. So what's critical to understand is that chronic disease only occurs when we lose the ability to make new cells that work. So let me say that one more time. Chronic disease only occurs when we lose the ability to make new cells that work. So what's it take to make new cells that work? Well, as I mentioned, cells run at minus 25 millivolts, but it requires minus 50 millivolts to make new cells. And as we also pointed out, if you measure across a cell membrane in a Petri dish, you'll get about minus 90 millivolts. So we need to, to make new cells, we need minus 50 millivolts, but we also need all of the materials that are necessary to make new cells. This is called nutrition and requires a functional digestive system, including stomach acid. And finally, we must deal with any toxins that destroy cells as fast as we make them. The most common toxins are heavy metals like mercury, dental toxins, GMO foods with a pesticide called Roundup or glyphosate. So what's the body's voltage and wiring system? Well, the body has five battery packs. The most important, are perhaps, or at least the largest, is our muscles. Our muscles are rechargeable batteries, and the fascia around the muscles serves as the body's wiring system. Our cell membranes are small batteries called capacitors. Water inside the cell membrane is called easy water, uh, which is H3O2, and it's an electron donor form of water. Inside the mitochondria, we have a rechargeable battery system called ADP, ATP. And then finally, our DNA has its own battery using scalar energy. So this diagram was sent to me by Dr. Al Tubiak, who is also a medical artist, and uh, I'm grateful for his sending this to me. What one sees here is that we have the muscle battery packs. So one must understand that the um, muscles are piezoelectric. So what does that funny word mean? If you take a piece of quartz and you squeeze it with a pair of pliers, it emits electrons. So the, f the process of distorting something and causing it to emit, emit electrons is called piezoelectricity. So one of the reasons that we exercise is that doing so causes the muscles to emit electrons. Now our muscles are rechargeable batteries as well, and so every time we exercise, we're actually recharging our muscle battery packs. Now in addition, our muscles are stacked one on top of each other in a very specific order uh, to create a battery pack. Uh, and it's that uh, pack of our stack of muscle batteries is surrounded by a stocking of fascia. And thus, uh, this stack of muscle batteries and fascia uh, creates uh, the muscle battery pack for every organ. That is to say, every organ in the body has its own battery pack. And such a pack of muscles is called an acupuncture meridian. Now, each acupuncture meridian uh, extends from a, a leg to the brain or an arm to the brain and then makes a loop and comes back to near its origin. So the, um, these large muscles then are acupuncture circuits. Uh, are the major battery for all of our organs. Now, each of these circuits runs through very specific teeth, and thus our teeth are an integrated part of every circuit. As the voltage from the muscle battery packs gets to the cell membranes, we have another battery pack here, or a, back, a battery that is called a capacitor, and that's the cell membrane. Now, if you take uh, a, an electron conductor 
and a second electron conductor and separate them by an insulator, you have what's called a capacitor. A capacitor is actually a type of small battery. The difference is that a regular battery can discharge electrons slowly, whereas if a capacitor is asked to uh, deliver electrons, it empties itself, uh, and so uh, it then has to recharge. Well, our cell membranes are made by opposing pairs of specific types of phospholipids uh, that have a ball on one end and two legs on the other. The balls are electron uh, uh, conductors and the legs are electron insulators and thus they form a capacitor. So we have our muscle battery packs, then we have the cell membrane which is a capacitor or a small battery, and just inside the cell membrane we have what's called easy water, which I'll uh, explain more about in just a moment, and then we have our mitochondria. Now inside the mitochondria we have a rechargeable battery system. When the battery is discharged it's called ADP and when it's charged it's called ATP. And then finally we have the DNA uh, which has uh, its own power system in that scalar energy implodes into the center of the DNA to give it its voltage. So here we see a diagram of the easy water. EZ stands for exclusion zone, and um, so um, you can see in the upper image on the right, the EZ zone is thinner, and if you expose it to specifically infrared light, it expands uh, into a larger uh, battery pack, if you please. Next we have the DNA battery. So the the characteristics of DNA was first elucidated by Rosalind Franklin in 1952. Her work was stolen by Watson and Crick, and they received a Nobel Prize for the for the uh, technology that they took from Dr. Franklin. Nevertheless, you can see on the left her original picture. Uh, photographing the DNA from its end. Now most pictures of DNA that you see are from the side, but when you look at it from the end you can see its uh, uh, torsional pattern and also the hole down through the center. So scalar energy implodes down through this uh, hole or canal uh, in the center of DNA uh, to energize it uh, because scalar uh, energy will implode into anything that's golden mean and certainly DNA is golden mean. Now the scalar energy as it implodes into the DNA is capable of reading the code there. It's capable of transmitting that code to a new cell if a cell division occurs. It's also capable of communicating with nearby cells uh, through the use of the scalar energy. Uh, this work has been recently published by Konstantin Mael, a, physician, a physicist in uh, Germany. Now let's look a bit at the voltage oxygen control mechanisms. So if we look at the fetus, Everyone understands that there is the umbilical cord that comes from mother uh, providing blood uh, and nutrition to the growing fetus. But it's important to know that this umbilical cord also brings voltage into the fetus. Now as you can see the fetus has very little room for exercising uh, inside the uterus and thus the normal mechanism of uh, charging our muscle battery packs is impractical in a fetus who has is in the process of growing its muscle battery packs and acupuncture wiring system uh, and there's just not room for that. Well at the time of birth a string is tied around the umbilical cord and it is cut so that it uh, leaves the new baby free from the umbilical cord. This then scars over on the end and becomes our umbilicus. Now it's at this point when the umbilical cord is cut 
that the baby switches from this fetal or original wiring system uh, to the uh, muscle battery pack acupuncture system. Now, here you can see that surrounding the uh, blood vessels, we have a fibrous sheath, uh, and this fibrous sheath, like the fascia, is capable of, uh, of uh, acting as a wiring system and moving electrons from place to place. So one of the things you should remember that in the f in, in our, around our blood vessels and also uh, surrounding our muscle battery packs, we have this uh, fibrous uh, connective tissue around the muscle battery packs. It's called fascia, and it has a different name around the um, the uh, arteries and veins called tunica adventitia. Important thing to know is that these structures are semiconductors. So what's a semiconductor? A semiconductor is a collection of molecules arranged in such a way that electrons flow through them at the speed of light, but only in one direction. So understanding that helps us understand how the body can quickly move electrons from one place to the other. For example, if you put an essential oil on the foot, the frequencies of those are at the, in the brain at the speed of light because those frequencies travel through the uh, fascia, which is a semiconductor. Now in the fetus, as you can see, then we have this wiring system going to all of the organs. And in this slide, you can see how that works. So it goes from the centa through the umbilical cord to basically every organ in the body using the semiconductor of the, uh, of the tissue around the vessels. Now, because the uh, umbilicus scars where it was cut uh, from the umbilical cord, it is blocked. Electrons cannot flow through there. However, if you simply put the biotransducer with its scalar energy over the umbilicus, what you will find is that it reorganizes the scar, as we'll discuss later. And once it does so, electrons can now flow through it. And so now we are capable of, again, using the original fetal wiring system. So when you open this system, now you have access to that original wiring system that goes to every cell in the body. One of the reasons that this is important and useful is that uh, this system is rarely blocked, whereas muscle battery packs can be blocked by uh, scars, uh, dental infections, emotions, etc.